Hello, hi, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Esther N, Chief Sustainability Officer of City Developments Limited, or CDL in short. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, definitely, we need to future-proof our built environment through innovation. So today and tomorrow, we have two very exciting innovation and technology panel. And uh, well, we are all here because cities has very high carbon footprints, accounting for 70% of greenhouse gas emission and also consume 50% of natural resources. And uh, building alone, if you can see this chart, almost 27% is represented by building operations and management. And uh, today we are going to share some of the latest solutions that will help you manage your properties in a more sustainable manner and uh, for CDL we are headquarters in Singapore with a, a global presence of 29 countries and regions and we are very glad that we have also pledged for net zero uh, using the World Green Building Council framework and what we have pledged for is uh, by 2030 all our new buildings will be net zero and 2050 all building the older building, existing building as well. So I think uh, all of you have actually learned, uh, read this uh, wisdom of Winston Churchill that we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape our, uh, us. Whether it is health, carbon footprint or, you know, productivities and performance. So World G Green Building Council is pushing for net zero whole life cycle. And then, uh, of course, today we are all talking about race to zero. And uh, as of now, uh, supporting uh, participating countries, regions, cities, and uh, organizations and investors account for 91% of global GDP in the race to zero. So for CDL, as a developer and also um, property management, there are three deliverables that we look at. First one is decarbonization, which is no-brainer. We need to decarbonize to work towards net zero. That is the global goals. Second one is digitalization and innovation. Without innovation, you can't move the needle. You can't talk about net zero. So today we are going to present some of the solutions for your, you know, to, to share. And last but not least, we need to disclose because investors, shareholders, everybody want your data. So sustainability, ESG reporting is very important. So um, now I'm really happy to have like a panel of five uh, innovators. They are all focusing on how to manage property and uh, maintain properties in a sustainable manner. And uh, not just startup. It's actually we have some mature company that has like, you know, um, evolved themselves and also produce innovations that is also looking at decarbonization. We have five of them today. Uh, we will start with AMP Energy and uh, Jacob, and then we will have uh, Sean and um, uh, H3 Zoom AI. And uh, also, you know, we have SP Group and we have uh, CBM Solutions as well as the Robotic enthusiast uh, Professor Mohan and uh, now without further ado I will leave it to uh, Jacob to share how what is the wonder of MPAC in, uh, in one of our projects we have actually piloted over the last six months or seven months it actually helped us to reduce carbon footprint by about 85 percent and also save costs by about 23 percent so it is possible to do good and do well at the same time okay over to you Jacob Right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Esther, for the wonderful introduction. Um, my name is Jacob. I'm from Amped Energy. So Amped Energy, we are a battery energy storage system specialist. Um, we specialize in replacing diesel generators within the construction sites. So really what our mission and vision for the construction industry is to have an emission-free future for construction. And what that means is to have a construction industry free of carbon emissions, free of noise pollution and also um, reducing the air pollution in the, in the site as well. The problem that a lot of our construction sites in Singapore face right now is that there is there's power for using in the um, site office and also for workers' quarters, but a lot of the heavier equipment on the sites, such as the tow cranes, the material hoists, are powered by diesel generators because these equipments typically require a lot of power. Um, the problem though is that when you're using diesel generators, they are typically not the most friendly for the environment. As we know, diesel generators are pollutive, they are noisy, they come with their own suite of problems such as maintenance issues, uh, fire risk, safety risk, and, as, and 
of course, most importantly, like we mentioned, they do produce a lot of carbon, carbon emissions, and also affect the air quality. So we came together and said that there must be a better way to do this. And with that, we turned towards looking at batteries to solve this problem. What we have came out with is a battery energy storage system that looks roughly like that. It's housed in a 10-foot container, making it easy to be transported between sites and within sites as well. Um, what we have here is the world's first construction energy storage system that enables us to be able to replace diesel generators within construction sites. If you were to look at it, what we, what we have here is a radically different system from a diesel generator. What we have here is a product that has no diesel engine inside, which means it's a lot quieter. This is very beneficial, especially now, you know, we have a lot of construction sites near residents, so noise has become quite a big issue as well. And of course, because it's a battery system, it's fully automatic, it's plug and play. You switch it on, you don't have to worry about maintaining it, you don't have to worry about switching it off at the end of the day. Um, as a connected device also, we do have a lot of data that we capture on the input and output and operational productivity of the product, which I'll share a little bit more in a short while. And last but not least, I think what really sets ourselves apart from the competition is that we are a product that's focused on the environment. We do reduce um, carbon emissions, like Esther mentioned, by up to 85%. And we have no air pollutants at all, no NOx, PM, SO2. Um, predominantly today, how we are using it within construction sites, we are using it to replace diesel generators that power heavy equipment such as your tower cranes, your material hoist, passenger hoist, welding machine, bar bending machines. Now, all of us that came here today via transport, you have seen a lot of heavy equipment uh, at construction sites along the way. There are heaps of construction sites in Singapore, a lot of tower cranes. Vast majority of these, like I mentioned, are powered by diesel generators. So what we are hoping is we can replace those diesel generators with battery systems as well. We are very proud and very honored and very thankful to have worked with CDL for one of the pilot projects since the end of 2021. Uh, we worked with CDL on one of the key projects in Irwell Hill Residence, which is a luxury condominium located at River Valley. So as you can imagine, this is an area which is very noise sensitive. Uh, there's there's a, a place which al uh, allows uh, people to have construction, but you can't have too much noise. You need to be uh, aware of the environment as well. So deploying our product there actually helps reduce the noise pollution for the environment, but also reduce the air pollution and we do have some quantifiable benefits in terms of carbon reduction and cost savings as well. So what we did was originally there were two diesel generators on the site. We have replaced both with one unit of our battery called the entertainer and we power two tower cranes. Uh, in doing so, we are actually 32 times quieter than a diesel generator. So like I mentioned, make it a lot more uh, conducive. And in terms of carbon footprint reduction, we have a quantifiable way of reducing it by up to 85% versus using a diesel generator. So this is a reduction of about 50 tons per year. How we are able to track this is that we have an IoT system that manages tracking all these carbon emissions. So not only are we able to reduce carbon emissions by 85%, this data is quantifiable, is trackable, is auditable. It's great, like Esther mentioned, for ESG reporting. And certainly, more importantly also, is that not only do we become more green, but we do so at a cost reduction. Because we are much more energy efficient than a diesel generator, we actually end up saving uh, operational costs by up to 23% in this particular case. So again, once again, we are very happy to, to share our technology with you. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm at the booth at the back. And hopefully, we get to have a chat about this as well. Thank Hello. you. Hello. Hi, I'm back. Um, can I have the mic on, please? It's on. It's good. Hello. 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 Yeah. yeah. It's good. Okay. It's on now. Hey, Jacob. This is really too good to be true, and I'm sure there were also challenges and hurdles when we first implemented it. Can you share a little bit on the yes. on the truth behind yeah, yeah. it? Yeah. Most most certainly, as the I would say, the um, couple of couple of challenges that we have faced. Uh, the biggest of which is, of course, number one, education of customers, education. Because the vast majority of the construction industry is used to using diesel generators. For them to switch over the batteries, they need to understand how it works and what are the benefits and how it actually helps with their uh, uh, construction site. And number two, Esther, like I'm, I, I think I would like to point out also is that currently we serve a lot of the main heavy equipments in the construction site, uh, but we do not. Uh, cover all of the applications within the construction site yet. So this is something we are slowly working towards to cover other things such as site office, workers' quarters, and other kind of electrical use within the construction site as well. 
Wonderful. So how have been the um, uh, key feedback from, you know, the pilot projects? I mean, apart from us, I know that we have some fellow, uh, you know, contractor also using it. Right. What were the learning points? Right, right. Great. Um, so far, we have deployed with quite a few of the, the largest developers and main contractors within Singapore. Um, the biggest feedback that we've seen so far is firstly that the operational expense has reduced drastically because as we are all aware now, diesel price has shot up tremendously in the past year. And with the reduction of, of diesel uh, consumed in the site, the cost uh, savings is enormous, number one. And there are very quantifiable carbon reduction, which is what a lot of our progressive um, um, developers such as CDL is very concerned with. And obviously, what is most important also is that the noise reduction is very, very obvious. If you step into a site now, you don't hear the diesel engines anymore. So it's really a much more conducive working environment. Wonderful. One last question. What is the big plan ahead of you? Yeah, so as a, definitely what we are hoping to reach out is to reach out to more construction sites in Singapore to help with the decarbonization of the construction industry, but also work with a lot of all these partners to see how we can integrate this into an entire digitalization of the entire construction site as well. So that's really our big plan of moving forward in Singapore. Wonderful, thank you, Jacob. Yeah, so uh, today we are all looking at like drones, the AI, you know, digital solutions to help us to even design, you know, how we build, how we orientate our building and all that. So the next one, the next um, innovator is actually uh, Sean Koo. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, uh, H3. H3 Zoom is actually an AI specialist that actually using technologies to help to design and also to manage uh, building in a more sustainable manner. Over to you, um, uh, Sean. Right. Hello. All right. Thank you so much, Esther. So, um, just about our company. So, we are part of a larger group known as H3 Dynamics, um, and we started uh, back where in a, uh, way back in 2015. So h3zoom.ai, uh, we actually leverage on artificial intelligence and drone technology to help property developers and the construction industry digitalize um, their current uh, processes and workflows. Um, and actually, we help them identify issues um, you know, in terms of failing facade or any um, sort of preventive maintenance um, before... Um, I would say uh, before the commissioning of buildings. Um, so to date, um, we've actually um, you know, worked with a lot of um, the clients, um, I would say from the public sector as well as the private sector, um, property developers such as CDL, as well as government agencies such as, uh, such as JTC Corporation, uh, the Housing Development Board, and as well as Singapore Power. Um, our solutions have been deployed uh, and implemented to help um, our existing clients solve some of these uh, productivity and, and safety issues as well um, by increasing productivity gains by over 70% um, and uh, mitigating uh, work at height. So um, just a snapshot of our accomplishments, right? So, um, you know, start, started way back in 2017. Um, we've already, um, we are already embedded um, in the town councils. So out of 17 town councils here in Singapore, uh, our solutions have been deployed uh, across 11 um, in terms of uh, periodic facade inspections, uh, which is a new regime that was recently announced by the Building Construction Authority just this year. Uh, we are already conducting 118 inspections. Um, outside of Singapore, uh, we are in five countries of operations, specifically in Thailand, um, Japan, uh, Brazil, um, Australia, um, as well as uh, the Philippines. Um, you know, the amount of data that we've captured for analysis has amassed over 35,000 hours, and the tallest building we've inspected here in Singapore is approximately 254 meters. So, you know, obviously all these accomplishments and accolades wouldn't have been made possible without strong support from both government and the private industry. So with the likes of JTC Corporation, you know, they are our co-development and, and commercial partner, uh, with HDB, they've supported us in the commercialization and launch of our solution uh, within the town councils. And specifically with CDL, uh, we are in the process of conducting um, pilots and POCs, and specifically with uh, a luxurious condominium, Pierre Mong Grand, uh, we've already started to see some uh, efficiencies solved. Outside of Singapore, our solutions have been tested and trialed with Grovener, uh, one of UK's largest private property uh, management uh, uh, organization. So how does our solution work? 
So compared to the conventional and traditional way of inspections, which uses you know, human visual insights to just identify defects on buildings and all, um, and, and, and basically the use of, um, um, I would say, mobile devices to capture uh, images for, uh, for reporting, our solution automates this entire process in four simple steps. So the acquisition of data can come from third-party sensors, um, such as drones or off-the-shelf cameras. It goes through a series of uh, 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 automation and workflows, um, and through our computer vision algorithms, automatically identify and flag out defects. Um, and this information um, is automatically categorized uh, with remediation suggestions for rectification and, and, and for rectification works. So, you know, in terms of benefits, you know, the solution is scalable given that it's built on the cloud and it's also helped address some of the safety and work at height issues um, that the industry has seen today. Um, with faster inspections and lower costs, uh, we definitely do see uh, a huge adoption um, within the industry. Ultimately, our goal is to help uh, asset owners maximize the life cycle value of, uh, of their assets. So we've developed a suite of solutions that comprehensively cover construction, commissioning, commissioning and operations and maintenance. And in terms of facade inspector, which is our flagship product, um, the use of drones have helped uh, facilities management uh, companies um, you know, uh, accomplish more than 70% productivity gains and at 50% uh, cost savings. With Interior Inspector, we are currently working with large property developers and construction companies to address some of these inefficiencies when it comes to quality site inspections. And this is all I have. Um, so if you're interested to find out more about our solutions, please head down to our booth and table um, to learn more from my colleague, Kai Wen. Thank you very much. Hello, thank you, Sean. This is really, really good for just now, just to recap, actually, um, operation of buildings globally account for 27% of greenhouse gas emission. So with your technology, and uh, I'm sure you have big plan ahead, but there are also challenges and barriers. So far, how was, you know, how did you overcome all these challenges and what were the, you know, most popular questions that, you know, developer or asset owner ask you? Right. So, so thank you, Esther, for the question. So, definitely, um, with uh, with a deep tech uh, technology like ours, one of the biggest hurdle was education. Um, we spent, you know, the last couple of years doing our research and development stage, educating the market, um, and and really getting, um, I would say, the, the value proposition to major stakeholders. Um, when it comes to property developers, you know, at the end of the day. They're looking at how the solution can help them maximize you know, the life cycle value of buildings. Um, and we've actually demonstrated this you know, through pilots, POCs, and ultimately you know, commercial launch uh, of the solution within their properties and estates. Well, changing mindset is the most difficult, right? Yeah. And then uh, everybody thinks green is expensive and it's costly. But now with the global goals and also with our Singapore uh, Green Plans 2030, we are all too familiar with the Green Building Master Plan already, the 80-80-80 goals, right? So do you see that that is a great potential for your business? And also when there is good potential, I'm sure there are also other competitors as well. So maybe you can share with us how HC H3 Zoom is uh, focusing on this and how do you differentiate your products you know, versus the competitors? So, so thank you for that question. So I mean, um, competition is, is always um, you know, around, right? And we've really started to um, look into extensive uh, products and maturing of our solutions. So in terms of um, sustainability, uh, we are already starting to look at uh, thermal analysis uh, and analytics on thermal imaging uh, acquired by uh, our sensor data, right? And, and basically through this analysis, we're able to help uh, property developers and asset owners identify potential energy loss uh, within, within assets and buildings. So this will help, you know, um, I would say, um, achieve, help you know, them achieve some of these net zero goals uh, in the coming years. Um, in terms of competition, um, you know, going outside of Singapore is, you know, one way of addressing the competition. You know, the Singapore market is small. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, we are already uh, operating in five countries within Southeast Asia and APEC. And ultimately, the goal is to, you know, um, I would say accelerate um, some of these growth initiatives uh, within the industry. 
Well, we all talk about what gets measured, gets managed. So data to us as asset owner is very important. So do you see that your H3 Zoom can help to step up on you know, collating data and also help asset owner to analyze the data and find solutions to close the gap? Uh, yes, so so definitely, um, that's, uh, that's, that's where we see the value. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, data is the new oil. Um, and you know what we realized and what we found, you know, through our interactions with our clients, um, ultimately is to help, um, uh, basically, um, help identify uh, insights, right? Uh, and, and basically, date and intelligent and actionable insights drawn from this data that's captured um, can help them make the right decision when it comes to remediation and rectification, uh, which is the next, uh, which is uh, which is the final step in terms of closing the loop. Um, and for some property developers, when they look at um, transactions, right, um, the goal is to, you know, I, I keep going back to the point of maximizing life cycle value. Um, you know, when we look at uh, transacting buildings, um, the goal is to, you know, help, you know, maintain the valuation of these buildings during the transaction stage as well. Yeah, wow. Do you see ASEAN offer you great growth potential being the third largest you know, e uh, uh, populous economy and uh, also undergoing fast urbanization. What do you see the potential of ASEAN region? Yeah, yeah so um, we definitely do a, uh, see a huge uh, potential in ASEAN. Um, as you mentioned, ASEAN is one of the largest growing, um, I'll say, um, I'll say uh, market in the world. Um, in terms of construction, property, uh, management, uh, we've also seen huge growth specifically from some of the emerging markets like uh, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Philippines. Um, and, um, you know, given, um, I will say, this emergence, the adoption of uh, such technologies would definitely be useful uh, for some of our clients and partners in, this, uh, in, in these economies. Okay, one last question for you, Sean. Sure. You are relatively young as a startup and very successful over a short span of time. What, will, what is really your successful formula to share with some of the startup here? Um, so, so I think, um, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's a cookie cutter uh, um, uh, formula per se, but ultimately, uh, you know, we've been successful through, you know, a teamwork and also addressing uh, the market needs. Um, so being customer centric, identifying key problems that um, the market actually, um, you know, needs solutions for, as opposed to be being more product centric, uh, has, hel uh, has helped us uh, over these years, right? And, and essentially, um, um, you know, through this sort of, uh, you know, um, being agile has also helped us um, overcome some of these regulatory hurdles. Wonderful, Sean. You know, thank you so much. And uh, well, we will probably come back to you if we have extra time for Q and A. Sure. Yeah. So talking thank about you. being agile, a lot of people think that you know only young startups are very agile and very you know um, uh, proactive to the changing business landscape. And uh, I'm going to prove you wrong. Um, SP Group is one of the most established conglomerate in Singapore, and uh, all your you know electricity bills, you know, always see the SP logo there, right? So now I'm going to pass the mic to the stage uh, to uh, Satin to talk about how SP have also stepped up on solutions and uh, to help us enable a greener, healthier and more low carbon built environment. Over to you Satin. Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thanks Esther for that um, introduction. It's quite humbling. Um, so as Esther mentioned, um, we're from SP Group. Um, I don't think SP is a stranger to anyone here locally as well. We're on a mission to empower the future of energy to help the nation as well as our customers in the region decarbonize. And we're doing that through our power grid and SP services business units, as well as some new business units called Sustainable Energy Solutions and SP Digital as well. So I come from SP Digital, which is a startup within SP Group itself. And we've been around for about five years. And our key mission is to power sustainability with energy tech to help our customers improve energy efficiency within their buildings in the built environment, improve occupant experience, as well as reduce carbon emissions. So how do we do this? We built a suite of solutions under a suite called GET, which stands for Green Energy Tech. And within this, we have five different modules that address different asset owner and tenant requirements when it comes to improving energy efficiency and decarbonizing. 
for the focus of today's session, I'll be focusing what you see in the middle, get control, which is an intelligent uh, building control and optimization solution to improve indoor environmental quality. So before we get into it, let's take a step back and understand what is the state of occupant experience today in most buildings. So, you know, being in this space, we see that there's actually very limited indoor air quality visibility in the sense that this information is not real time and usually it gets measured through annual audits, right? And through these things, that also limits the ability to control and do real time optimizations. This then in turn has an effect on the occupants. Uh, there's a lot of documented research and studies which show that this impacts occupant health, performance and productivity for the organization as well. And with traditional and conventional building systems, the approach is usually doing a lot of manual reactive adjustments and this leads to very poor operational efficiency as well. Right? Um, and finally, in an environment where there's more and more urgency and demand to improve energy efficiency of air conditioning systems, there are actually very limited tools and means at disposal of building managers to improve air side energy efficiency. So what is the solution to all of these? Within Get Control, we have a really innovative module and technology. It's called Dynamic Airflow Balancing Technology. And as the name suggests, it responds to very dynamic and real-time changes within the indoor environment. So we adopt a cycle, a flywheel, if I may, that senses analyzes and controls the air conditioning in real time. The sensors measure a wide array of data in real time, not just temperature, humidity, and air quality, and there are many various aspects of air quality as well. For example, PM 2.5 levels, um, as well as uh, volatile organic compounds. We also look at factors such as the occupancy levels within different rooms, different zones within space. All of these data is then analyzed through algorithms on the cloud. And the AI engine doesn't just look at the indoor data. It also correlates this with external data. For example, what's the ambient temperature and weather conditions? What is the weather forecast as well? We also take into consideration the position of the building based on the latitude and longitude. This dictates how much solar radiation different parts of the building is getting at different times of the day. So through all of these, the system intelligently crunches this multitude of data and then works to optimize the air conditioning, right? So we have these smart nodes and dampers that actually do mechanical control of the airflow right down to individual microzones and diffusers within the space. So all of these has the desired effect of smoothening temperature and humidity within the space, which is illustrated in these heat maps that you see here. So before we implemented this dynamic airflow balancing technology for some of the customers, uh, they had a lot of hot spots which are represented by the red that you see around windows and the parameters of the office. Through dynamic airflow balancing, we were able to smoothen the temperature and humidity distribution, making it more comfortable for occupants as well as more energy efficient as well. So just to share with you a real world example of how this works in our tropical climate here in Singapore, we're very proud to have worked with um, CDL for their offices at Republic Plaza, which is just across uh, the bay from here. So we deployed this to solve a few technical and operational problems that they had. So a lot of their ACMV systems, the air conditioning systems, were operating at constant settings and they also had to do frequent manual adjustments when there's feedback from occupants and tenants, right? So they wanted to solve these suboptimal um, issues and at the same time as a very enlightened landlord and employer, they also wanted to ensure the best workplace and employee experience for their staff and most importantly, as Esther has shared, advance their sustainability goals to be a net zero organization. So we've implemented Get Control, the dynamic airflow balancing module that I shared with you about, some additional capabilities with dynamic chill water balancing and also outside air optimization. So this led to about 22% improvement in occupant comfort in CDL's offices. And at the same time as a bonus, uh, it was also 17% more energy efficient. So we're looking forward to being able to do more of this with more buildings in Singapore. Thank you. So if you guys want to find out more, uh, we're just at the booth at the back. Please drop by and give us uh, time to explain to you. Sorry. No, 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 Harry Satin. Uh, thank you for having us to pilot this. I'm sure all the building owners will give you a long wish list, right? Uh, after COVID, when we try to you know, um, give the peace of mind for tenants to come back. 
mm. a lot of tenants talk like they are expert now, you know, how, how is the air quality like? Is it how's your filtration system working? Are they safe, you know, to breathe your air and all that? I think this is really, we need technology to help to ensure we can prove uh, to our, you know, building users that it's a safe place. Mm. But there's also another challenge is Singapore is sitting up twice as fast as other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So you want a space that to be cooler, to be less humid, to be safe in terms of air, air quality, and it's a long list of wish lists. Do you think GET can actually, you know, satisfy all these, address all these? Yeah, appreciate the, the challenge, Esther. So I think uh, GET control is very well placed to address all of these challenges. Um, it addresses, uh, it, so we, we don't talk about just IEQ indoor air quality, we look at indoor environmental quality and there are many aspects to this, right? I'll reference the Harvard Healthy Buildings Lab where they talk about various parameters you need to look at, right? Uh, which is air quality, um, I talked about some of these parameters that impact that, carbon dioxide levels, volatile organic compounds, as well as thermal comfort which is based on temperature and humidity as well. So we didn't get control, I may not have covered everything today, we've got different modules that address these things, the thermal comfort, air quality uh, through things like outdoor air optimization, which regulates the fresh air intake into the space as well, as well as humidity controls, right? And we do all of these um, in a dynamic way, taking into consideration the real-time changes. And I think, Esther, there's another aspect as well. We're seeing that the way buildings are getting utilized and occupied is changing. Organizations are moving to uh, hybrid working models where you're starting to see that throughout the day there are going to be varied levels of occupancy and staggered occupancy on different days of the week as well. So then how do landlords and asset owners adapt their buildings, their systems, their processes and get their people ready to deal with these dynamic changes, right? So I think get control is one of the answers to this and we're happy to have further conversations with anyone that's interested. Well, we do have like, you know, very challenging goal, 80, 80, 80, you know, the Green Building Master Plan and all. And uh, I think the biggest challenge is not the newer building, the smarter building. Mm. Your challenge will be like, how do you help the older building, the 30, 40 years old type of building? How can get help all these older building owner to improve their air quality, improve their, you know, thermal comfort and their humidity? Yeah, excellent question. Appreciate that, Esther. Um, so Get Control, we've deployed it in Singapore. In, uh, we, we're currently deploying it in some greenfield projects. At the same time, we've actually deployed this in a number of brownfield buildings. So they range from six years old buildings to something that's uh, in the CBD about 25 years old. I, I can't recall Republic Plaza. It's probably around that vintage as well. Um, so it, it's actually Get Control is an ideal solution for brownfield buildings because it leverages a lot of the advances in IoT. So a lot of the data that I talked about, the deployment of sensors, these communicate wirelessly on very robust and durable mesh technologies. So they're very retrofit friendly, very minimal cabling and engineering work that's required, right? So again, without getting into all the technical details and weeds of it, uh, it's ideal for brownfield buildings as well as greenfield buildings. Wonderful. And uh, we know very well, right? Tenants pay the rent. They are really the king, right? And uh, some want, want the space to be colder. Some want it warmer. So as building owner, actually, it's very challenging. Some want it 21, some want it 22, some want it 23. And, you know, so how do we educate and change the mindset of building users? In the tropics, we don't really need to wear a suit. Right? And how do we change the mindset? I think it also take, um, you know, uh, overall, you know, the, the um, like regulators mm. and the industry players and, you know, everyone's to be on board to accept sure. what is thermal comfort. Is it 23 or 24 or even 25? So do you think SP Group, you know, can contribute in this area apart from technology, you know, apart from skill set, how can you also educate building owners, yeah. building users, you know, their mindset? Yeah, so again, I say another excellent question, right? So um, I, I think there are really a lot of regulations in place for these, uh, in, you know, in terms of recommending the ideal temperature. Uh, within indoor spaces, so there's the green mark standards, there's the local building code SS554, uh, if I recall correctly. So they mandate that you should keep temperatures at 24 degrees and that range between 23 to 25 degrees. And then, of course, you know, comfort is subjective as, as many things in life are, right? 
Um, but I think it's using some of these information to engage and educate, using tools like Get Control, where you've got visual, visual heat maps, right? So people can understand in real time, um, rather than basing, you know, after the fact, um, information and measurement. So I think these are some ways to help. Um, also, being a technology company, we understand that technology is really a tool. It really depends on using the right tool in the right way and for the right purpose as well, right? Um, and at the same time, there's a need to engage users, educate them, um, you know, in terms of the perception people have, and also a fair amount of change management. So I think these, these are things that as a technology provider, we are particularly, uh, you know, aware of, and we're trying to educate through tools like this, to providing information that's more visible and accessible in real time to all of the stakeholders. Yeah, sounds really good. And uh, actually, since 2007, we have a one degree up campaign with all our tenants. And uh, since 2014, we actually issued, a, uh, launched the green lease. And uh, by 2017, we have 100% you know, participation of all our tenants because the good thing is all our tenants have to report their carbon footprint. Exactly. Yeah. So we are seeing really some light in the tunnel as a building owner. And uh, what is the big plan for you? You know, SP Group, there's huge potential, right? We are being in yeah. the tropics and I'm sure you can use GET and technology to help to provide better Thermal comfort, yeah. humidity, and also improve performance of building users, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we see a lot of uh, new developments coming up in Singapore, you know, redevelopments in the central business district, um, even in the business parks, um, you know, f further out as well. So we think that's an opportunity for any asset owner that's developing a new building to open up um, their minds, not just look at conventional systems that have been around for decades, but to really look at the innovations in technology and future-proof your buildings and assets, right? Because ultimately, it's, it's about differentiating, providing more value to your tenants. It's also about making sure that from a share, shareholder and financial and regulator perspective that you don't um, end up with stranded assets with outdated technology, right? And I think for brownfield buildings, if you're looking at uh, asset enhancement initiatives, a and &E works, that's actually a very good time to review and adapt your technologies and systems within your buildings, right? And to support that, we're looking at localizing the solution more for our tropical climate, making it easier for our customers to be able to interface and integrate this with existing systems within their buildings. Um, so through all of this, we hope to give customers more choice and empower them to decarbonize and uh, get themselves uh, ready in this race to zero. Wonderful. Thank you, Satin. Thank you so much for that. And uh, talking about race to zero and building management, we all know that building and facility management is not quite a sexy industry, right? When the lift and lights are working, nobody call their facility managers to say, oh, good job, right? When the lights are not working, aircon not working, the lift not working, immediately there will be huge you know, complaints everywhere. So how can we really survive and uh, improve on facility management? I'm going to invite the next speaker who actually is representing CBM Private Limited, who has been around for 50 years. Years. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary last year, uh, last week. So, um, uh, Tan Hui Yen is our uh, uh, CBM, uh, the next speaker, who is uh, also an engineer. And uh, we need to look at how do we engage users and also look at technology and, di and uh, AI and digital solutions to help us manage better improve productivity to address all the new challenges. Yeah, uh, over to you, Huyen. Yeah, thanks, Esther. Okay. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Uh, Today, we, we actually have a system called DigiHub where it actually uh, makes use of uh, IoT sensor as well as uh, some of the uh, 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 leverage on the technology to, to actually improve on the workflow in terms of the uh, FM. And uh, today, I'm talking about, uh, I want to actually share about the demand based maintenance, which is one of the main features in the DigiHub. Okay. Uh, CBM is uh, 50 years old. Uh, today, have, uh, we have separated the 50 years old uh, uh, in the last few months. Uh, uh, 
uh, we actually set up this uh, company CBM solution where it emphasizes on the uh, uh, energy efficiency as well as uh, 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 those uh, technical solution for in the FM industry. We were established in uh, 2009 and uh, we are accredited uh, energy service company with uh, NEA as well as we register with the PE board to provide a professional engineering service. Okay, uh, apart from the ISO uh, certification include the ISO 9000 as well as 14000 uh, and, uh, and uh, 45000, we also uh, uh, register with the PE board uh, to uh, to provide the uh, energy service com energy service uh, 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 professional engineering service as well as uh, energy service company we also register with SGB SGBC to provide the turnkey solution for the for the property owner okay we all know typical FM uh, deployment uh, in the uh, buildings in the built environment 30 percent of the resources are actually uh, uh, deployed for preventive maintenance uh, uh, service whereas another 70 percent out of which uh, 20 percent are actually looking into the routine inspection uh, uh, as per the of course a checklist as well as a 50 percent is uh, addressing the ad hoc service such as sometimes police uh, sometimes a building owner actually asking for light change asking for uh, clearing the toilet chokes and so on and in conventional maintenance approach we know that uh, uh, typically, uh, uh, regardless of whether your your equipment, your major equipment, whether uh, come with the redundancy uh, or come with the duty, and uh, we maintain, uh, we actually send our service uh, team to maintain the equipment either monthly or bi monthly, and so on. And today we are looking at demand based maintenance because most most of the property. Uh, their essential equipment come with the standby and the duty, duty and the standby set. If we're going to carry out uh, uh, very often maintenance, it will be uh, 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 overkill. That's why we rely on the uh, IoT sensor and uh, of course it coupled with the uh, AI uh, diagnostic tools to uh, 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 you know, predict when the major equipment they are going to fail rather than be based on the running hour. Just for example, uh, when we all drive a car, we don't always depend on the uh, mileage of the, you know, the, 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 the running mileage to actually uh, make the engine oil change. We as a driver, as an IoT, uh, uh, you know, we can always say that we as an IoT uh, 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 detector, we actually, when the moment that we actually detect anything wrong, we will send our car to a, a workshop for repair. So IoT sensor is actually uh, uh, doing this work. Okay, uh, basically in the building, we actually segregate the uh, uh, M&E system into an ACMV, electrical, as well as a pump, uh, and so on. And uh, we actually rely on the IoT sensor, which is uh, here, and uh, attached to the major equipment. When this IoT sensor collects the information, it was sent to uh, AI to analysis. When there is a... Uh, alarm or there is uh, any irregularity found, it will actually pop up in the system and show it to us. If the operating condition is within the tolerable uh, range, your alert will be sent out. If it is uh, beyond the alert, uh, beyond the, 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 the si danger situation, alarm will be sending out. Of course, uh, let's look at this. Uh, uh, out of these uh, four major equipment, like for example, pump, generator, equipment, and ACMV, we actually uh, uh, install IoT sensor on this major equipment where this, this IoT sensor will collect the operating condition uh, and fit it into the system. Of course, the key benefit uh, is, is uh, after the uh, sensor, uh, after the application uh, operating condition is actually collected, and uh, it, AI will analyze. Uh, then this will help us to include, yeah, in, improve the equipment uptime as well as reduce uh, maintenance frequency and prolong the equipment lifespan. Okay, let's uh, take example. Illustrate with this example. We actually implement this in uh, in uh, to maintain the chiller or. Uh, of the Republic Plaza, where in the routine uh, uh, maintenance, we are supposed to uh, maintain the chiller once a month uh, over a period of, for example, over a period of 12 months, in the, we supposed to have a 12 cycle maintenance. But 
after we install the uh, IoT sensor, we actually managed to cut down to a six cycle, six cycle per year, which is uh, almost a 50% reduction. Other than that, uh, we, we all know a digital check checklist, because out of the 70%, 20% of our technician time is using to uh, every morning uh, go through the uh, 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 buildings, come through the building, and uh, based on the checklist to, to check whether all the M&E systems are in operational requirement, uh, in a good condition. And with the digital checklist in the DG Hub, and with the you know monitoring system, we are able to reduce the frequency of maintenance to uh, let's say uh, instead of every day we do it, we can do it by we can do it once in every two or three days. This will help us to reduce the manpower uh, deployment. And of course, robust SOP is a must. You you have a very good system, but you must have a robust SOP to address abnormality. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, Based on this uh, case study, uh, we actually implemented the uh, DG Hub in uh, Republic Plaza where we managed to, give out, to get about 30% kind of manpower saving. Okay, thank you so much, Wei Yan. And uh, well, definitely we need technologies to help us improve in terms of uh, efficiency and all that. But I'm sure there are actually a lot of challenges in the FM business. And uh, especially during COVID, there are a lot of actually workers that go going back you know, to their hometown. So labor crunch has always been the biggest challenge. So how has actually DigitHub help you, you know, to manage the building and operations better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Esther. This is actually a very good question. You know, facility management, we rely on manpower to address our service requests. Like, for example, you know, toilet show, like, for example, aircon too cold or not cold. So labor crunch is actually a main issue, especially today, post-COVID situation. So what to do? I mean, we have to leverage on the technology and uh, to improve our productivity. Productivity improvement, uh, productivity gain is actually key to a, a sustainable building, uh, sustainable solution. So far, how has been the response after you know uh, you successfully piloted at Republic Plaza? Yeah. Okay. Just now I share about the demand-based maintenance side. Right? This is one of the. Uh, module, one of the major module or one of the major feature of the DG Hub. Actually, our DG Hub actually come with a uh, utility monitoring feature, also come with a uh, performance monitoring uh, uh, of a major equipment, as well as uh, improved workflow in uh, FM sector. So, uh, so far, uh, 18 buildings, we have deployed uh, this system for 18 buildings in Singapore, and now we are in the midst of to deploying uh, uh, another three buildings uh, uh, soon. It's wonderful just to share that it's not just uh, digital solutions. In fact, uh, this Digit Hub has helped us to get a little discount from uh, SDG Innovation Loan. And uh, that actually proved that we have two enablers to help us improve uh, facility management. That is technology and also tapping on sustainable finance, which is actually fast growing. So you need resources, you need skill set, and of course you need funding. And uh, thank you for that, uh, Hui Yen. And uh, well, we have the final speaker, Mohan. He is one of the most passionate persons on, uh, you know, uh, to talk about robots. And uh, when we have the rehearsal, I can even see the little child in him that talking about robot and how robotic technology can help, uh, you know, people to manage our buildings and environment better. And uh, Mohan, uh, Professor Mohan is actually the uh, engineering uh, product development, you know, um, pillar and uh, professor in uh, SUTD. And uh, over to you now, uh, Mohan. Thank you, Esther. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Mohan. Thanks for the introduction. I'm very glad to be here in this uh, forum to share ongoing work with research, development, and commercialization uh, on reconfigurable robotics at SUTD. So first, what are reconfigurable robots? So these are robots like Optimus Prime and Bumblebee that you may have seen in Transformer movie from the Hollywood, right? But it's just that the robots we develop do not fight battle. Instead, they do cleaning, they do inspection, they do pest control, they help 
the workforce, in terms of the labor struggle that we are facing, in terms of improving productivity in some of these dull, dirty, and dangerous work processes. So we have a number of robots that we research in, in at SUTD, and reconfiguration principle enable the robot to go way beyond the commercial platforms as well as the robots that are prototypes in, in literature. So the first robot I want to introduce is our H-Tetro, the cute looking transformer robot that cleans flow. It derives inspiration from the Tetris that we all know. We play with our smartphones, console games. The robot changed shape to provide a significantly higher degree of area coverage compared to traditional platform. When the robot sees constrained space, it changes shape, assume eye form to navigate through, achieve much significant area coverage because of the reconfiguration ability. So we have compared the performance of our robot to commercial robots in the market. And if every single case, our robot win the game. And the robot win the game by tiling the entire flow. When it comes to the game of Tetris, we play. When our screen is tiled up, we lose the game of Tetris. Here, the robot tile up the whole flow and wins the game of cleaning. It's not just about disruptive solutions like our Tetris robot for flow cleaning. We also tackle new solutions. We have hundreds of companies making floor cleaning robots. But when it comes to staircases, there is none. As a part of our design process, being a design university, we look at empathy. We look at real needs of the user and the market. We see that with, with staircase cleaning, there is no robots in the market. And even in the robotic research literature, there is very, very few. So we moved on to tackle this problem to develop our s -tetro. The robot is capable of cleaning flow, classifying staircases into 10 different types, straight, left-leaning, right-leaning, spiral staircase, generate control primitives to climb and clean staircases. The robot is equipped with AI and autonomous capabilities to avoid any obstacle, both static and dynamic. So we have demonstrated the ability of the platform so far to climb seven stories at SUTD autonomously and clean. And here we have breakthrough technologies that are going to change the environmental sector in a big way. So in terms of reconfigurable robotics, SUTD is rated the best in the world, above MIT, above top leading universities. We hold over 3% of all publication in the domain of reconfigurable robotics. With that position, we wanted to make socio-economic impact. We moved in to translate our technologies as licenses to commercial company. We have successfully transferred over 10 tech licenses through revenue sharing agreement between the companies and the university. But we wanted to go even further. We saw a huge potential to have an ecosystem of robotic companies in Singapore. That's when I joined hands with, with commercial player to push the boundaries further. So we have platforms that deal with uh, smaller units like Scorpio. Again, the platform has been pushed further for licensing into commercial commercialization. So Scorpio is an inspection platform. It's capable of crawling, rolling, and wall climbing. So it is less than 10 centimeters in its rolling diameter, but it possesses transformative ability. And such platforms are very much needed in inspection domain. It's not just small robots. We also do big vehicles. So we have our autonomous speaker, so sweeper, that has reconfiguration ability. It compresses and expands. And it is to be deployed in pavements to sweep pavements. With autonomous vehicles, there is a number of research that has been ongoing, and we have demonstrative platforms out there. However, when it comes to pavements, there is very few. So here at SUTD, we are developing reconfigurable pavement sweeping platforms that can compress, allow for people to pass. We have individuals jogging, running, wheelchair users, personal walking with pets, and we need versatile robots like Pantera our pavement sweeping robot. And this is how the reconfigurable robots are going to transform. And some of these are licenses that have been transferred to commercial companies. Companies are either working on this platform, bringing them to market. In some other cases, the robots are already available in the market, like the ones we have in our booth behind. So again, we have a big um, inspiration to, start, to have startups that are based in Singapore, and they can transform and lead the whole world in prop tech domain. The very first company that I, uh, I started off was Lionsbot. I co-founded the company with my partners, Dylan and Michelle, who are from the cleaning sector. So we have a good mix of understanding of robotics, what are the disruptive technologies, what is the product strategy, and also a clear understanding of the market, both local and global. So with that, we launched three classes of products. We now have over 1,000 robots in 28 countries. Our largest market is Europe, and Singapore is one of the markets that's very close to our heart. 
So we recently launched our R3 class of robots in the, uh, in the market, and R3s are hotcakes in the market now. So again, you know, we are thankful to thankful to pioneer industry leaders like uh, CDL, with whom we have deployed our robot at the Republic Plaza, and we are looking with pioneering leaders, bringing our robot everywhere locally and globally. And we are on our track to be a global leader in this domain. So it's not just about cleaning. So we have also inspired other companies from from SUTD. The other company is Motor Robotics, the company design and manufacture robots for pest control. And the most popular of their robots is their mosquito control robot. What does the robot do? The robot move around and attract mosquito, trap them and kill them. And we even provide daily count reports on daily count mosquito counts. How many ADES mosquitoes were captured on that day? This is very, very important. Assume um, the current work processes like fumigation. We do fumigation, but there is no data on how many mosquitoes were killed. There's no control meshes. And now we have robots that move around places like NUS, Techno Age Canteen, River Valley High School, where it's important to protect the youth, protect our adults, protect our elderly from dengue. We have had over 30,000 cases of dengue last year. And this year is hitting well about 18,000 so far. And this is a, a trend that is to continue because of climate change. So we need productive solutions. And here we are leveraging on our research at SUTD and spinning off companies that can bring first of its kind solution. So here, our Dragonfly uh, platform is the world's first mosquito control robot. So we have commercial robots already deployed. We have a residential version for low floor HDB, condominium, landed properties, semi-D, where also dengue cases are very, very high. So we have an affordable solution that we are bringing to the market. Again, these are research that is not limited to developed world alone. We have interest from Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Mexico. And these are developing economics with big problems with mosquitoes. It's not just dengue, they have malaria, they have chikungunya, they have West Nile, a lot of mosquito-borne diseases. And the impact can not be just solved with more people, because this is a problem where just having low labor costs cannot solve the issue. And robots can play a big role, and Singapore, we can lead. So again, we have a big motivation for the global youth to learn robotics using our Singapore design and made robots. So with that came uh, Vifa Robotics, a company inspired from, a, from our lab at SUTD. So the company designed and manufactured education robots for the global youth to learn STEAM, science, technology, engineering, AI, and mathematics. So we have 100 units out in nine countries. We have top-notch universities like RMIT, Zhejiang in China, Tokyo Denki, IIT, University of Colorado, taking our units in the first run. And we want to revolutionize. We want global youth to learn robotics with uh, an organic advantage of recognized uh, education domain we have here. We see um, propagation of uh, the company for them. So we also have uh, uh, another startup, Oceania Robotics, that design and manufacture um, marine maintenance robots. So these are robots to do dull, dangerous, dirty, repetitive works like hull blasting, uh, with grid, with water, inspection, paint removal, work processes in uh, shipyards. So we are working very closely with our marine contractors and shipyards, deploying the robots on a rental basis. Again, we have now four companies that have been spinned off, leveraging on research uh, at SUTD. So again, every event like this help us to connect with collaborators and we move further. And I'm very thankful for venues like that. I'm thankful to CDL for helping us to outreach the work that we have and this helps us in making our robots meaningful, literally meaningful, add a meaning to our robots. Yeah, thank you again. Wow, you all can feel the passion in uh, Professor Mohan, right? And uh, definitely prevention is always better than cure, right? I had dengue last year, it was awful. So looking at all your robots, so Transformer is no longer a movie, eh? it's reality now. And, uh, but it is too good to be true. Uh, what are the challenges, challenges that you have faced as SUTD that that come up with so many successful solutions, but I'm sure there were also some barriers and challenges. Name us one or two of that and how you overcome it. 
Yes, so when it comes to challenges, robotics are new in many of the work processes. So gaining acceptance is very, very important uh, because these work processes have traditionally been uh, manual work processes. So that, so in our case, we have a, a big advantage being a design university. We don't start with technology, but rather we start with needs. We reach out to cleaning professionals, we reach out to cleaning service companies, we reach out to cleaning equipment manufacturers, distributors to understand what is the price point, what are the right specifications, what is the problem on the ground, what would be the best product for us to go in first, and that drive research. So in this case, we overcome the major challenge of product and expectation fit in the market. And that goes with every single case, education, pest control, cleaning, marine sectors. Yes. So far, do you feel, you know, Bigger, you know, a greater uh, receptance to your product because uh, it's like a double-edged sword, right? Technology and some countries that do not face any labor crunch, they may feel that technology and robots are taking away my job. Uh, do you face that type of uh, challenges? Yeah, this is a great question. I get that all the time, right? So I would address it at two layers, right? So the first is we develop economy like us. Um, we have huge labor shortage. So it's never a question of robots liberating jobs, right? In the sector like pest control or cleaning or even with marine, no, there is always jobs, right? But nobody want to take up the job because it's dull, dirty, should be under the hot sun and, um, uh, and sometimes at times it could be hazardous environment with a lot of training that is needed. So robots can really help us. So our cleaning professionals can work hand in hand where robots clean the floor area and our, cle our cleaning professionals can handle handrail, uh, lift panels, uh, curbs that are much more difficult for robots to access. Our robots would be very expensive, at least for now. So we overcome that. Moving to developing countries, we also see a trend of integration of robots into work processes. Why? Because nobody want to be a cleaning professional. And probably we are looking at the last generation of cleaning professionals. Everybody is moving to other gig jobs like Grab, Food Panda, uh, and so on. And there is forever cleaning professionals even in developing countries. So we see this as a, as a trend that is not going to be reversed and not temporary due to COVID, but it will go further uh, and a trend that is also in, in developing countries too. Well, time flies. Actually, I attended the SUTD opening almost like a decade ago and uh, being a relatively younger university, how, you know, has uh, SUTD come along now? And I'm really glad to see so many in interesting innovation. And tomorrow we are going to see another innovation from SUTD as well. And uh, how do you engage the younger generation, all your students? You know, I'm sure when they join SUTD, they have high expectation. They want to dream big. So I'm sure not every dream can turn into reality. So how do you manage the expectation of the younger generation as an educator? Yes, so again, this, this is a, a great question. So with SUTD, University of Technology and Design, the students go through design curriculum. And, and again, they implement it not just with uh, product development, process development, but also to their own life. So in terms of where they want to go, how they do planning, looking at precedence, uh, like what others have achieved and what is the right way to achieve success through these means, leveraging on positives and overcoming any shortfalls, right? So they do not have to repeat. So again, it is embedded. In fact, with our courses, we have one social science course for every term. Right, so that is that we see that we see value. If one good example I can give you is with our uh, Lionsport robots, or even with our robots from other companies, we could see with Lionsport robots, these robots have life in them. If you are going to look at our competitor robots, they are simply box on wheels, right? So here there is empathy that makes huge difference in in the designers uh, from that that graduate out of SUTD, uh, who make the robots more lively that our cleaning professionals can be very proud to work hand in hand with, right? To be a real companion. And the same is true in terms of uh, uh, expectations as well. There are great examples like the companies that we produce from here, IPs that we transition, and this inspire them to go further. And this serves as a, a foundation for them to look at as precedents and, and to build their career. Well, before I ask the last question, is there any question from the audience? You and uh, our all the five innovators are still here. Anyone? Want to ask any questions? Ah, okay, Joy. Yeah, from World Green Building Council. Thank you. There it's are four other innovators here. Who, who do you want to address this question to? Um, I address to all. It's a very simple question. What do you need from the industry to help you the most to, to, to help everyone around you? Yeah, Mohan so, first, then we pass to uh, M. 
Yeah, th thank you. So I, I, I see one way is for us to come together to do a participatory design of these solutions that are upcoming. We now know for sure we need smart and sustainable solution and we cannot develop it in solo. So we want to collaborate with the industry and take a participatory approach in designing our solutions for the future. Wonderful. Uh, Jacob, do you want to take this question? How can we involve an industry to help you, you know, raise the performance of M Energy? Right, right. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Just want to just want to echo also what Mohan mentioned earlier. Definitely, collaboration is very important for us. And as um, trying to pioneer a new technology is always very difficult because there's a lot of um, skepticism of new technology, and also you know generally the construction industry tend to be a bit risk adverse for good reasons. So having that participation and collaboration is very important to enable us to share each other's pain points, right? So what are the challenges that you're facing? How can we uh, help you to improve your situation? How can we quantify this improvement for you? That's very important. So sharing of information and having that um, bilateral share of information is actually a very important part for us as well. Wonderful. How about you, Sean? What is your wish list for industry support? Hello. Yeah, so, so I think um, some of the meta points have been hit. Um, and, and even for H3, I think it's really um, getting the education uh, bit across. Um, because uh, what seems to be lacking is specifically when we look at small media enterprises, um, there's, there's generally um, a gap um, between um, the government organizations that are definitely trying to drive adoption and innovation. And, you know, um, I would say operations per se, right? Small, um, for some of the small media enterprises, um, you know, even um, they are um, finding it hard to distill some of the information that is, 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 is coming like, you know, top down. So I think being able to, um, sh um, I would say, um, fix this gap and to, uh, to basically push for more education of what technology and innovation can actually help um, in terms of solving some of these inefficiencies, uh, that would definitely, uh, you know, uh, I would say help uh, elevate the industry uh, overall. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. How about you, Satin, from the SP Solutions perspective? Did you? Well, I, I don't think it's a big ask. I, I, I think, as I alluded to earlier, really approach the technology with an open mind um, because the technology is really, the technology is ripe. It's really about... Uh, opening up your mind and moving away from conventional approaches and, and uh, systems, right? Um, and also then when it comes to building a business case, open up your minds that it's not really just absolutely looking at cost and you know everything has to be cheaper than another solution. You have to look at things from a multitude of ways. Uh, you have to look at some of the long-term benefits, the total cost of ownership, and sometimes not all of these things are easily quantifiable. They're quite strategic in nature as well, right? And I think besides an open mind, I think the final ask is to take action, right? Because I think, as you've seen from the innovators here, from some of the technologies I've presented, everything's ready. It's just on all of us to take that action, right? Wonderful, good point. Uh, Hui Yen, what about from the FM business perspective? See, I, I see. S sustainable I, I mean, productivity gain. I think is a is a key to a sustainability as well as a decarbonization. Hope that uh, all of you can actually leverage on the technology, leverage on the today's uh, what we have now to actually uh, make it uh, more productive in terms of delivering your FM solution. So look for us. Thank you. Well, we are really uh, living in an era that uh, digital revolutions and sustainability converge. And uh, we always have the saying that we take a, it takes a village to raise a kid, but it takes the whole world, all industry, all sectors, to save our world. So with this, I would like to you know, call upon everyone to join us again to thank all these five innovators. And tomorrow at 5 o'clock, come back again, you will meet five very, very shining stars of our startup, young and passionate people. Do support them, whether you're in the industry or any sector. Without innovation, without technology, without solutions, you can't talk about a race to zero. So with this, thank you very much and have a good lunch first and then enjoy your summit. Bye-bye. Cover it up, you like to play your own game